The Prince of Wales and Camilla Parker Bowles seen together in public coming down the steps of the Ritz after the 50th birthday party for Camilla's sister. No secret about their relationship now, none possible at all. The picture that people have waited so long to see. Quite brief, really, out of the doors, down the steps, into the car. Absolute cascade of flashbulbs. The scene that says so much about the Prince of Wales, the love of his life, and, of course, his possible future. The relationship between Prince Charles and Camilla Parker Bowles began in 1972 and continued to evolve under a cloud of deceit and scandal. Their affair survived Prince Charles's marriage and divorce of Princess Diana and continued after her untimely death. For years, Charles and Camilla denied their adulterous affair to the world, but as events proved, it was true. At a momentous time, two single people with grown-up children, the couple emerged from hiding, and finally, on Saturday the 9th of April 2005, His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales and Camilla Parker Bowles became man and wife. Though a huge media event, it attracted only a fraction of the crowds that congregated for the wedding of Charles and Diana. Like so many events in the history of the House of Windsor, many people approved and just as many did not. I disapprove of the way Charles and Camilla treated Diana. It was despicable. I think it's been wonderful. I'm so glad so many people have turned up to see them. It has divided the country. People very much fall into the Diana camp or the Charles camp. People, there are a lot of people who don't like Camilla, a lot of people who think that Camilla is responsible for all the Diana unhappiness. I love Diana to bits, but at the end of the day, she's no longer here and life goes on. This sort of controversy frequently surrounds the British monarchy, but the facts of the relationship between Charles and Camilla read like pure fiction. To begin with, their ancestral records show that the great-grandmother of Camilla was the mistress of Charles's great-great-grandfather. So in this case, history did repeat itself, and to fully understand these issues and many of the other extraordinary events in the history of the monarchy, one must understand the history of the House of Windsor. beginning of the 20th century, the House of Windsor ruled the greatest empire the world had ever seen. Ninety years later, the empire was gone, and there was much speculation about whether the dynasty could hold on to the crown itself. One monarch in particular was a notorious womanizer. He had plenty of one-night stands, he had plenty of short affairs, he had longer-term mistresses. Another renounced the throne to marry the woman he loved. He was blindly, totally devoted to her. They tried to present themselves to their subjects as the ideal family. Then a spate of scandals and divorces tore that image to shreds and shook the foundations of the institution of the monarchy itself. They didn't know what to do. They thought the monarchy was going to go. But at the end of a century that had seen crowns fall and revolutions rock the world around them, they would survive as the royal family. In the last decade of the 20th century, the House of Windsor was engaged in a fight for survival. Scandal after scandal rocked the royal family, and respect and deference for the crown was dramatically eroded. At times, it seemed that a monarchy that had lasted a thousand years in England could be facing extinction. It was a vast change from the picture in 1900 when Queen Victoria was coming to the end of the longest royal reign in English history, 63 years. In the Victorian age, Britain was the most powerful nation on earth and the crown stood at the centre of a realm in which the aristocracy still exercised enormous power and influence, while most of the ordinary people were not even allowed to vote. In old age, Victoria seemed aloof and haughty, but the young Victoria was happy, high-spirited, and madly in love with her husband, Albert, whom she married in 1840. Albert came from Saxe-Coburg-Gotha, a dukedom near Nuremberg in Germany. 
He was a studious and frail child who grew into a handsome and cultured, though penniless, prince. Victoria, then an already reigning monarch, proposed to him in 1839, and the two twenty-year-olds married the following year. Victoria and Albert's descendants took his name and became the house of saxe coburg gotha His Germanic origins would later cause them severe problems. In the first 17 years of their marriage, Victoria bore her husband nine children. The eldest, Edward, the Prince of Wales, would be the first monarch of the new dynasty. Increasingly, the young prince found his parents stuffy and boring, and in 1861, at the age of 19, he was sent away for a brief spell of military training. While he was stationed at an army camp in Ireland, some of Edward's fellow officers persuaded a young woman to creep into his bed at dead of night. When Prince Albert found out, he was furious. He resolved to tackle his son. He wrote a long letter, page after page, berating this poor Prince of Wales. Then he went to go and see him at Cambridge, where he was studying. And they had a little, little chat about all this, and then he forgave him for his transgressions. And then Albert went home, he got caught in the rain, and he got ill. Two weeks later, Albert died of typhoid. He was only 42, and Victoria was inconsolable at losing her beloved angel. She commissioned the spectacular Albert Memorial and went into public mourning for the rest of her life. For a long time, she felt her son's frivolity had killed the love of her life, and she was resentful. So Victoria tried to put a stop to Edward's sexual adventures by marrying him off to the exquisite Princess Alexandra of Denmark in 1863. The couple moved into Marlborough House and turned it into the glittering social centre of London. The long years of waiting to succeed to the throne had allowed Edward time to cultivate a whole range of vices. While his wife patiently bore him six children, the prince's insatiable appetite for women led him to be dubbed Edward the Caresser. The prince spent his life in an endless round of country house parties, card games, shoots, visits to health spas and days at the races. As he got older, he ate more and more, and his girth spread alarmingly. By January 1901, Edward was 59 and must have been wondering if he would ever become King of England. Then he received the news that his mother, then 82, had become seriously ill at Osborne House on the Isle of Wight. Edward rushed there to be at her side. Four days later, she died in the arms of her favourite grandchild, Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany. The Victorian era was over, and Edward VII was monarch at last. In 1901, Edward VII was crowned the first King of Great Britain and Ireland from the house of saxe coburg gotha After the austere years of his mother's mourning for his father, Albert, he wanted to brighten up the monarchy. As king, Edward VII created much of the ceremonial that would become the trademark of the British monarchy over the 20th century. The people on the whole welcomed the change. Victoria's reluctance to appear in public had been deeply unpopular and led to an outburst of republicanism. Edward's flamboyance changed all that. He loved public performance. And that was what the monarchy needed. It needed a showman. The British monarchy, with its pomp and circumstance, with its orders and its decorations, with its magnificent imperial crown, with its state openings of parliament, with its carriage processions, this is the monarchy that was put together for Edward VII. But the international situation in the early years of the century was tense. Germany was building a powerful navy. This was a threat to Britain's command of the seas, which the nation depended on to protect its vast empire. And although Edward was closely related to many of Europe's crowned heads, Britain was isolated and needed allies. His first diplomatic success came not with another monarchy, but with a republic, France. The alliance between France and Britain, agreed after Edward's visit, made Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany deeply uneasy. He was Edward VII's nephew, but the two men had never been close. Following the signing of the alliance with France, Britain then agreed one with the other great power on Germany's eastern border, Russia, which was ruled by another of Edward's nephews, Tsar Nicholas II. By the time the Russian alliance had been concluded, 
Edward's health was beginning to fail. On the 6th of May, he suffered a series of heart attacks, but the king's last conscious thoughts appear not to have been for affairs of state, but for the horses he had racing that day. I think at about three o'clock in the afternoon, he was told his first horse had won. He was very pleased. He then collapsed at about four o'clock and was told that his, uh, his second horse had, had won. And he said, I'm very glad. And we think they're the last things he said. He died about two hours later. The death of Edward VII brought his son George to the throne. George V had been brought up in the ornate splendour of Marlborough House, but he hadn't been intended for kingship. He had an elder brother, Eddie, the Duke of Clarence, born in 1864. Eddie was expected to inherit the crown, but by the time he reached his twenties, his parents were beginning to doubt whether or not he was fit to be king. Eddie was due to marry a German princess, Mary of Teck, in the winter of 1892. One afternoon at Sandringham, he came back from a shooting expedition feeling ill. A week later, he died of pneumonia at the age of 28. Eddie's death meant that the succession would now pass to his younger brother, George, the Duke of York. George was quite unlike his father. He had none of Edward VII's voracious appetite for women, and he was rather shy with them. But when his elder brother died, it was nevertheless essential to find him a wife. Princess Mary, who had been destined to marry Eddie, seemed the ideal candidate, but at first George needed a good deal of prodding and cajoling to initiate the courtship. The courtship was uh, initially very stiff and reserved. They were both uh, rather shy of each other. And um, the turning point apparently came when um, uh, they were on a, a visit to one of the royal houses and uh, Prince George's sister, Princess Louise, said to him, well, um, George, why don't you um, take uh, Mary down to the bottom of the garden and show her the pond with the frogs? History doesn't record what was said by the pond, but the engagement was announced a few days later. When George became king, the British Empire ruled over a quarter of the human race. In 1911, at perhaps the most magnificent imperial pageant in its history, he was crowned Emperor of India. But George couldn't ignore Europe. Like his father, he was related to many of its crowned heads and royal houses. The Kaiser was his cousin, and George got on rather better with him than Edward had. The Kaiser realised that George V was not the brightest personality. The Kaiser judged him as a thoroughly decent chap, but um, realised that he was um, not of a political figure. And certainly he thought no match for him intellectually. But a more relaxed personal relationship between the rulers of Britain and Germany did nothing to soothe the international tensions that were now building relentlessly and threatening the peace of Europe. In August 1914, George V found himself at war with his cousin, the Kaiser. Hopes of a quick victory were dashed as the armies fought each other to a standstill on the Western Front. Soon, the British people was involved in a conflict on a previously unthinkable scale. Soldiers were being killed and maimed by the hundred thousand. To keep the civilian population loyal to the war effort in the face of such appalling sacrifice, the Allies mounted an unprecedented propaganda campaign, spiced with lurid horror stories of alleged German atrocities. There is a, um, a propaganda attempt to portray the Germans as um, inhuman. I mean, the word Hun is used very frequently. The, the idea of a barbaric race from the East. As anti-German feeling mounted during the course of the First World War, George V found himself out of sympathy with his people. He thought much of the popular mood was xenophobic and hysterical, but in 1917 he bowed to the prevailing atmosphere. He announced that members of the royal family would no longer have to marry foreign princes or princesses, but could choose British aristocrats instead, and that the dynasty would take a new name, the House of Windsor. It was just the name of one of the most famous of the royal castles, Windsor Castle, uh, which had been central to our history for a thousand years. And so it was a very clever title to take, quintessentially English, harmless, easily recognisable, nothing German about it. 
Despite the problems with its name, the House of Windsor had a successful war. The king won admiration for his devotion to duty. He made constant visits to the front and presented 50,000 medals to soldiers. His dedication was sincerely appreciated by the troops. The heir to the throne, Edward, Prince of Wales, served as a staff officer in France. To his enduring irritation, he was kept well away from the thick of the fighting because the government was afraid he might be captured. His younger brother George, the Duke of York, served in the Navy. He saw action in the main naval engagement of the First World War, the Battle of Jutland. When Britain finally emerged on the winning side in 1918, the King was cheered ecstatically for days on end. Elsewhere in Europe, many of George's relatives were losing their thrones. The Kaiser and the Tsar had both been deposed, one by defeat and one by revolution. But the euphoria at home soon faded. Three quarters of a million British men had lost their lives in the war. The survivors had been promised a better life. Instead, the country slipped into economic crisis. Factories closed. Unemployment rose. People came back after the war, imagining that the whole country would be rebuilt, rebuilt in their interest, and found that it was being run by, <coughs> in a famous phrase, uh, hard-faced men who looked as though they'd done well out of the war. But working people, including women, had gained the power of the vote, and the old aristocratic order began to lose its grip on the levers of power. In 1924, the Labour Party was elected to government for the very first time. Some of its leading members had Republican sympathies and called for the abolition of the monarchy. When Labour came into office, George V was concerned, but he knew the King's duty was to be loyal to his ministers, whether he shared their views or not. But other major social changes were also taking place in the 20s. There were the flappers, the fast living, the breakdown of old courtesies, but also the rigidity between classes. George himself, of course, was driven into a rage if he saw women with short skirts or people in casual clothes. If you had a medal on upside down, George V would see you and ball you out from 250 yards. In spite of George's grumpiness, he and Queen Mary grew to be very happy together. Unlike most of his predecessors, there was never any suggestion that George was unfaithful. The letters between them were really quite frank on his part. He's saying, um, you know, I wasn't sure when we first um, got engaged um, how much I loved you. And he's very honest about that. But uh, he, he caps it by saying, but as, as I got to know you more, my dear girl, you know, you are more than... You're more precious than life to me, and I love you very much indeed. George V wasn't devoted to his wife only. He was also devoted to his duty as king. He knew that he wasn't gifted or charismatic, but with his modest approach, he managed to recreate the British monarchy as a more human institution. His subjects could now identify with the royal family as people not too different from themselves, and by the time he celebrated his Silver Jubilee in 1935, George had won their hearts. It was his ordinariness, uh, his modesty. He knew he didn't amount to very much, and therefore he was able to play the best hand he could with what he had. Uh, and I think the English and the British uh, people responded to that. And by the time of the Jubilee, of course, he was universally loved and regarded. Soon after the Jubilee, George's health began to decline, and he became increasingly anxious about his eldest son, Edward, Prince of Wales. The prince was rebellious and showed no inclination to get married, even though he was into his forties. This was a source of great sadness to his father and mother, and there was an endless procession of what were regarded as suitable virgins. Uh, none of whom attracted him anyway whatsoever. You see. He was attracted to older married women. The prince had embarked on a whole cavalcade of love affairs, many of them adulterous. The establishment was rattled. The prince's private secretary, Alan Nacelles, told the Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin he thought it would be a disaster if Edward became king. My father said that he'd sometimes thought that when the Prince of Wales was out steeplechasing, that it would be better for everyone if he fell off and break, broke his neck. And Stanley Baldwin said, well, I'm not shocked by this, and I've had exactly the same thought myself. 
George V died on the 20th of January 1936. He was 70 and had done a decent job as monarch. His foreboding about the kind of king his son would make led him to prophesy sadly, after I'm dead, that boy will ruin himself within 12 months. When he became king in 1936, Edward VIII would plunge the House of Windsor into deep crisis. Yet, as a dashing and glamorous Prince of Wales, he'd seemed full of promise. He had everything. He had f extraordinary charm and vivacity, and he was a very good speaker, and he would put himself to endless pains to put himself over to the largest number of people. He rarely did have star appeal. But Edward put his matinee idol looks to less edifying ends. At his home, Fort Belvedere, he conducted a string of love affairs with married women. An MP's wife, Frida Dudley Ward, who was slight and pretty, was his mistress for 15 years. Next came another married woman, the American beauty Lady Finesse, twin sister of Gloria Vanderbilt. When she went back to the States in 1934, she asked her friend Wallace Simpson, another American, to look after the prince while she was away. Wallace was in her mid-thirties and already on her second marriage. The prince was captivated. She was, to him, the perfect woman. She had everything he was looking for in a woman. He was besotted by her. And within a month or two of their first rarely getting to know each other, he was completely and irrevocably hooked. Edward decided that he had to marry Wallace, even though he knew it would cause a major political crisis. Under the Constitution, the reigning monarch is also the head of the Church of England, and the Church frowned on divorce. Would he have to make a choice between his love for Mrs Simpson and the Crown? When Edward succeeded to the throne in 1936, many people were excited by the thought of a new, forward-looking king. Edward wanted to be a populist and to free the monarchy from the domination of the upper classes. But the king was completely under the thumb of Wallace Simpson. She took pains to make it clear to everyone that she ruled roost. She would give orders to the staff. She would indeed dismiss the staff if it happened to annoy her. She would allow Edward VIII almost no for discretion as to what happened or what didn't happen. She delighted in showing and exerting her authority. The general public didn't know the king was dominated by Mrs Simpson. They didn't even know he was having an affair with her. Although newspapers in Europe and the United States were full of stories about the royal couple, in Britain there was a complete silence in the press. The inner circles of the establishment knew exactly what was going on, but they were determined to keep it a secret from the multitude of ordinary citizens. Stanley Baldwin, the Prime Minister, didn't mind Wallace being the King's mistress, but he was alarmed when Edward confided to him that he wanted to marry her. He asked Baldwin to dinner. Mrs Simpson was there, and he said, I felt it was high time that my Prime Minister should meet the woman I intend to marry. Baldwin, I think, pretended not to hear that remark, because on the whole, Baldwin's solution to any problem was not to hear it. But it registered. In October 1936, Wallace obtained a divorce from her second husband, Ernest. Soon she would be free to marry the king. The monarchy was facing its most serious constitutional crisis in two centuries. The news finally broke in December 1936. The problem was that Edward was obsessed with his overwhelming need to marry Wallace Simpson. He cared much less about being King of England. Edward VII's mother, Queen Mary, was horrified that her son, Edward VIII, would consider placing his desire to marry Wallace Simpson before his duty to the nation. Many people believed that monarchs were chosen by God and none had ever voluntarily given up the throne. Edward's attitude seemed a threat to the whole institution. As Prince of Wales, but his mind was made up. On the 10th of December 1936, he announced he was abdicating in favour of his younger brother. He'd been on the throne for just 11 months. But you must believe me when I tell you that I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do, without the help and support of the woman I love. 
Before he went into exile, Edward was given the title His Royal Highness the Duke of Windsor. When she married him, Wallace became Duchess of Windsor, but to Edward's great annoyance, she was denied the rank of Her Royal Highness. That resentment was to show itself in behaviour that would cause anger and embarrassment to the new king. When George VI was crowned in December 1936, after his brother's abdication, his first act was to go to his mother, Queen Mary, and cry on her shoulder. The man who was taking over the throne had had a difficult upbringing. His father, George V, had been incapable of showing affection to his children, and he constantly found fault with the behaviour of both his sons. Like his father before him, George had been sent to naval college at the age of 13 to train to be a sailor. At first, it was an ordeal. George was bullied, but he persevered and became an officer, though he never loved the Navy as his father had. During the First World War, he served on HMS Collingwood at the Battle of Jutland when it came under heavy fire. Three months later, the Prince was found to have an ulcer and had to return home for the remainder of the war. In 1920, George, by then elevated to the title of the Duke of York, met Elizabeth Bowes Lyon, the daughter of a Scottish Earl. It was love at first sight. The wedding was celebrated at Westminster Abbey in 1923. The marriage was the first fruit of the new policy of allowing members of the royal family to marry British nobility instead of foreign royalty, and it became the basis of a crucial change in the relationship between the House of Windsor and the British people. It is the key element of the 20th century British monarchy. This was the best of the British family, that everybody, rich but much more particularly poor, could identify with. Elizabeth and George enjoyed a very happy family life. They had two children. Princess Elizabeth was born in 1926 and Princess Margaret four years later. They lived in a house in Piccadilly. George saw no reason to put his daughters through a demanding education. He just wanted them to be happy. But George could scarcely have become king at a more ominous time. In Germany, Hitler's aggression was becoming more and more threatening, and it seemed that Europe was drawing ever closer to the second disastrous global conflict in a single generation. George hated the Nazis, but, like many in England, he feared another war. He supported the efforts of his Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, to appease Hitler and keep the peace in Europe. In 1938, Chamberlain averted war by signing the Munich Agreement, under which Germany seized a large part of Czechoslovakia. But the Führer was not satisfied for long, and after he had taken over Czechoslovakia, Poland emerged as the Nazis' next target. Britain had promised to guarantee Polish independence. As the storm clouds gathered in Europe in the summer of 1939, George VI and Queen Elizabeth embarked on a highly successful tour of the United States. George was the first British ruling monarch ever to visit the country, and he and President Roosevelt became friends. The Queen was sensationally popular with the crowds. When the King and Queen visited America in 1939, they had one agenda, to win over the American people. They needed the Americans. So the King and Queen came to Washington, and they ingratiated themselves to everybody. Two months after the King and Queen came home, Hitler invaded Poland, and Britain declared war on Germany. King George VI was increasingly embarrassed by the warm and friendly relationship between his brother, the Duke of Windsor, and the Nazis. In 1937, he and the Duchess had visited Hitler. On a personal level, Edward felt the respect the Germans showed for his wife contrasted sharply with the attitude of the British establishment. He also admired what he saw as Hitler's success in dealing with social problems like unemployment. He was very much uh, amazed how uh, Hitler 
got off the seven million, seven million unemployed we had in those days. In four years, there were almost nothing of the unemployed. At the beginning of the war, the Duke was appointed as a British Army liaison officer in Paris. But when the Germans approached the French capital, he fled with the Duchess. Some regarded his conduct as little better than desertion. It was expected of the other liaison officers that they rejoined British troops and found their way back to Britain. In his case, he collected his wife, um, motored through France into South France, then crossed the border into Spain. If Hitler managed to force Britain to the negotiating table, there was a German plan in existence to reinstate the Duke of Windsor as a puppet king. The Duke never publicly encouraged these ideas, but many people felt he should have taken more positive steps to deny and reject them, and so the government packed him off to the Bahamas as British governor to keep him as far out of harm's way as possible. It confirmed the views of those who felt he'd never been fit to be king. Meanwhile, Winston Churchill had taken over as Prime Minister from Neville Chamberlain, whose conduct of the war had been criticised by some as being weak and ineffectual. Night after night, Britain was bombed relentlessly. London in particular was targeted. There were suggestions that the royal family should be sent to the safety of Canada, but the King and Queen wouldn't hear of it. Day after day, George and Elizabeth visited areas devastated by the Luftwaffe, talking and listening to the homeless, the injured and the bereaved. The Queen, in particular, won all hearts with her ready smile and warm sympathy. In December 1941, Japan attacked the American naval base at Pearl Harbor, and America entered the war. It was a turning point. The road would still be long, but Churchill knew then that the Allies would eventually prevail. Germany surrendered on the 8th of May 1945. It was perhaps the monarchy's finest hour. The people and the House of Windsor had stood together through the dark days when Britain fought alone against Hitler, and defeat had seemed certain. Now, Britain had won after all, and an extraordinary bond had been forged between the royal family and its subjects. But the cost of victory was crippling. Britain was bankrupt. The nation could no longer afford to retain India, the jewel in the crown of the British Empire. During the war, a number of revolts there had had to be suppressed, and rebellions were costly. In 1947, India became independent. In the royal household, there were also changes afoot. George's elder daughter, Princess Elizabeth, had fallen in love with Philip of Greece, a dashing but penniless prince in exile, who had become a British naval officer. Once the war was over, Elizabeth wanted to get married, but the king was worried. She was headstrong. After all, she knew that she too was going to be a monarch. And she said, it's the least you can do after everything I'm going to have to do to let me choose my own husband. In the end, the king gave in, and Elizabeth and Philip were married in 1947. In spite of his poor health, his stammer and his lack of self-confidence, George VI had brought the monarchy closer to the people than ever before. However, the strain of war had taken its toll. He smoked and drank heavily and suffered greatly from stress. In 1951, he was found to have cancer and had to have a lung removed. Crowds gathered outside Buckingham Palace, anxious for news, but George was only 56, and over Christmas, he seemed to be on the mend. The following month, he went to London Airport on a cold, blustery day to say goodbye to Elizabeth and Philip as they flew off for a tour of the Commonwealth. It was the last time they would ever see him. In February 1952, Princess Elizabeth was in Kenya on the first leg of the Commonwealth tour. It was scheduled to last five months, but it came to an abrupt end when Prince Philip broke the news to her that her father was dead and she had become Queen Elizabeth II. Elizabeth was 25, 
For the first time since Victoria had become queen in 1837, a young monarch was ascending the throne, and once again, it was a young queen. There were fears that the stresses that had so clearly affected her father would be too much for this slight and pretty young woman. At the same time, there was excitement. People talked enthusiastically about a new Elizabethan age. I think that people were in intoxicated by the, by the young queen. I'm this really, she was lovely. I mean, you could sort of sense the feeling in the Abbey that this, all these old gentlemen and this very, very young person. In reality, the new queen was already asserting herself. It was she who insisted that her coronation be transmitted live on television, despite opposition from many of her councillors and courtiers. If it wasn't for her, the coronation wouldn't have been shown on TV. Um, that was an absolute uh, personal uh, decision of, of she and Prince Philip. They were pioneers and very brave. Ironically, the seeds of the first crisis of the reign were sown at the coronation ceremony. At its centre was the Queen's younger sister, Princess Margaret. As um, the royal family were leaving the abbey, Princess Margaret was standing there waiting for the coat to take her back to Buckingham Palace. And next to her stood um, Peter Townsend, group captain Peter Townsend. He worked for the Queen Mother at Clarence House. And as it was standing waiting there, Princess Margaret went up to him and she brushed away a bit of fluff on his uniform. And in no time, the story got out that there was something between Princess Margaret and Townsend. Peter Townsend was 17 years older than Margaret. He was dashing and handsome, a former Battle of Britain pilot. Unfortunately, he was also divorced. What made divorce especially horrifying for the royal family was its unfortunate link with the abdication of Edward VIII less than 20 years previously. The Duke of Windsor was still ostracized and in virtual exile. Margaret couldn't marry without her sister's permission. It was made clear to her that if she chose Peter Townsend, she would have to relinquish her title and her income. She'd have to go and live abroad. She couldn't be the Queen's sister. She couldn't be a princess anymore. She would be cut off from the royal family. But mainly, she would have to live on Peter Townsend's salary. And in the end, there was no choice. Princess Margaret couldn't give up all for love. The first crisis of Elizabeth's reign ended with Margaret giving up love for duty, while group captain Peter Townsend went into exile. Elizabeth may have been less glamorous than her sister, but like her father, she was hard-working and dedicated. In spite of her adventurousness in insisting on the coronation being televised, she was generally cautious and rather conservative in her approach to life and politics. Prince Philip, on the other hand, badly wanted to modernize the monarchy. As Philip went off overseas on tours on his own, stories began to circulate that the marriage was in difficulty. It was true that he and the Queen began to develop different interests and, to a large degree, led separate lives. But if the Queen ever did have any doubt about her husband, she never showed it, and she always believed she had an overriding duty to preserve the marriage. Philip was relegated to a supporting role in public, but the Queen let him rule the roost at home and take charge of their children's upbringing. The oldest, Prince Charles, was very different from his father. Whereas Philip was vigorous and athletic, Charles was timid and sensitive. By the 1960s, the world in which the Queen had grown up had changed radically. Britain had ceased to be a world power, as one by one, the colonies were granted their independence and the British Empire gradually slipped into history. On the domestic front, there was rebellion against authority and the rise of the counterculture. Britain became the trendiest place on earth for music and fashion. The Queen had two more children, Andrew, born in 1960, and Edward, four years later. But for all Prince Philip's efforts at modernization, the royal family was looking rather old-fashioned. There was a growing sense of boredom. Um, not so much the, the feeling that the Queen was out of touch, but that the world was moving on. A television producer married to a cousin of the Queen had the idea of relaunching the image of the royal family with a fly-on-the-wall documentary. See if she's uh, allowed out in 
For the very first time, viewers were allowed a peep at life at home in the royal family. It was a dramatic stepping up of the policy of focusing loyalty on the House of Windsor as an ideal family, close-knit and loving, rather than on the monarch as a powerful, grand and distant individual. Over 40 million people watched the programme. Many loved it. Some, though, felt it was a disastrous error in that it destroyed the mystique of anointed, sanctified royalty. The process of opening up the royal family to public scrutiny was enthusiastically pursued by Prince Philip. He broke with tradition by setting up photo opportunities, making controversial speeches and even giving television interviews. But he stirred up a hornet's nest of controversy when he told an American reporter that the royal family was short of money. Philip's remarks provoked anger and demands for Parliament to examine the royal finances. How could he plead poverty when surely the Queen was one of the richest women in the world? MPs complained their investigations were obstructed by the palace, but they did discover that the Queen paid no tax. For the moment, they didn't challenge the exemption, and the royal family received its increase in funds, but the issue would return. During the 1970s, it became difficult to realise that the royal family had once felt it wasn't getting enough media coverage, as interest reached fever pitch in Prince Charles's search for a wife. In 1981, in the most magnificent royal ceremony since the coronation, he married Lady Diana Spencer, who was sweet and charming and just 20 years old, 12 years his junior. Diana wasted no time in fulfilling her crucial duty of producing an heir. Just 11 months after the wedding, Prince William was born. Prince Harry followed two years later. With this ring, <coughs> with this ring, I thee wed. In the, name of the, father, the Queen's second son, Andrew, married Sarah Ferguson on another son. glittering royal occasion in 1986. Sarah was more ebullient than Diana. She was natural and spontaneous, and the couple appeared to be genuinely in love. The royal family had got its glamour back. However, things were not as optimistic as they seemed. Those close to them already knew that the smooth facade of Charles and Diana's marriage was a sham, and that it had been going wrong almost from the beginning. At some point, he just seemed totally to ignore her. So it was very early on one noticed, and I thought, well, here's this shy young thing. I did write in my diary, he seemed not to look after her. It soon emerged that he and Diana had very different interests. Furthermore, the nervous young newcomer to the royal family was getting better media coverage than the heir to the throne, and the heir didn't always like it. In February 1992, the Queen celebrated the 40th anniversary of her accession to the throne. However, it would prove not a triumphal, but a dreadful year for her. First, Sarah Ferguson's name was linked with two Americans, Steve Wyatt and his cousin John Bryan. In March, the palace announced that she and Prince Andrew had separated. A month later, the Queen's only daughter, Princess Anne, was divorced after 18 years of marriage. Then in June, a sensational book, Diana, Her True Story, began to be serialized in the papers. It was clear that Diana had cooperated with the author, who said that she was bitterly unhappy, that she had tried to kill herself, and that her husband had been conducting a long-running love affair with Camilla Parker Bowles. Today, this is all common knowledge, and we have since experienced the tragic end of Princess Diana. But at the time the book was published, it was shocking. It exposed the chaos within the modern royal family, as no book had done before. As the royal marriages were falling apart, on the 20th of November 1992, a devastating fire broke out at Windsor Castle. It was the Queen's 45th wedding anniversary. She was spending the night alone, as Prince Philip was in Argentina, attending a conference on conservation. The Queen may have thought things couldn't get any worse, but she was wrong. As the flames were doused, the government wasted no time in promising that the taxpayer would pay for the damage, estimated at half a million pounds. <laughs> 
the government minister who was responsible sort of promptly appeared on the spot and said, we, the government, i.e. the taxpayer, are going to pay. And I think the, th the idea that people felt very strongly was, why should we as taxpayers pay for this damage when the Queen herself is not one of these taxpayers? There was a public outcry and the government withdrew its promise. Within a week, the Prime Minister announced that the Queen had agreed to pay tax and to reduce the number of her relatives supported at public expense. Within three weeks of the Windsor Castle conflagration, the then Prime Minister, John Major, made another dramatic announcement. It is announced from Buckingham Palace that with regret, the Prince and Princess of Wales have decided to separate. Scandalous revelations about the private lives of Charles and Diana continued to fill the newspapers. Both gave television interviews admitting adultery. Within six months, in 1996, the marriages of two of the Queen's sons ended, Andrews in April and that of Charles in October. Princess Anne was already divorced. The family monarchy seemed to be heading for the rocks, and some people said the problems resulted from the Queen and Prince Philip's failings as parents. The most damaging thing for the House of Windsor was that Diana seemed to be winning the propaganda war. Her approach was the opposite of the royal family. She wore her heart on her sleeve and met the people head on. It was an approach that suited the public mood of the 90s far better than the more correct and restrained approach of the older members of the royal family. She made her husband, she made the queen, she made all of them look like amateurs. She was a pro at orchestrating her image and her press coverage. Then, on the 31st of August, 1997, when there seemed no end in prospect to the recrimination between Charles and Diana, the princess was killed in a car crash in a Paris underpass. In the week following her death, a million bunches of flowers were laid outside the royal palaces in London in an unprecedented outpouring of national grief while the royal family stayed away at Balmoral with Diana's children. The flag over Buckingham Palace wasn't lowered to half-mast. Everything the royal family did was that which protocol required, but most of their subjects weren't interested in the rules. The House of Windsor watched with growing alarm. I heard that they sat up looking at the television set in Balmoral, absolutely transfixed, that they didn't know what to do. They thought the monarchy was going to go. That's what I was told. They actually sat staring at the screen uh, in total unbelief, not knowing quite what to do. Many simply saw the royal family's behaviour as confirmation that it was uncaring. Newspapers poured out a torrent of criticism, demanding to know why the Queen wasn't in London, grieving with her subjects. Five days after Princess Diana's death, the House of Windsor realised it had to start breaking with protocol. William, William. Thank you so much. Thank you. The royal family returned from Balmoral to London. The flag above the palace was lowered to half-mast and the Queen broadcast to the nation. No one who knew Diana will ever forget her. Millions of others who never met her but felt they knew her will remember her. I, for one, believe there are lessons to be drawn from her life and from the extraordinary and moving reaction to her death. Diana's funeral was the culmination of the crisis which saw mounting demands for Prince Charles to give up his claim to the throne in favor of Prince William, or even that the monarchy should be abolished altogether. The first step in the survival plan was to recognize that the monarchy had to be trimmed. The most obvious public sign was the decommissioning of the Royal Yacht Britannia, a move that had saved the taxpayer £9 million a year. The Queen agreed that the number of royal personages paid for by her subjects through the civil list should be further reduced, and the palace also accepted tighter checks on its expenditure. The monarchy still had its critics, but its remarkable talent to adapt and survive, demonstrated in the recovery from Edward VIII's abdication, showed itself again. Talk of Prince Charles standing down in favour of Prince William died away. Abolition of the monarchy slipped off the agenda.
The Queen and Prince Philip believe their most important task is to pass the monarchy to future generations of the royal family, as earlier generations have passed it to them. The divorce crises of the 90s damaged the image of the House of Windsor as the family monarchy that had served them well for 70 years. Finding a new image for a new century could be a tricky assignment. The Queen's youngest son, Prince Edward, was married in 1999. There were some breaks with tradition. The Prince was only created an Earl, instead of receiving the more senior title of Duke bestowed on his brothers. He made it clear that he was going to carry on with his job of running a television company. But there was sufficient pageantry to show that regal tradition survived, and the House of Windsor was still there at the turn of the new century. Most recently, the marriage of Charles and Camilla has tested the strength of the monarchy once again. Polls show the British people unwilling to accept Camilla's title as that of Queen, although she will legally be the Queen if and when Charles ascends to the throne. The two have grown accustomed to controversy and to the impact of world events affecting their lives. The very fact that their highly publicised wedding was postponed because of the funeral of Pope John Paul II was just one more challenge to the couple's plans. The last-minute postponement led to reports of the Queen declaring the event jinxed, but the ceremony did come off graciously 24 hours later, proof once again that the monarchy is resilient. All of this may eventually be forgotten by a forgiving British people. Many simply want to move beyond the unhappy images of Diana and wish the newlyweds the best of luck. Only time will tell. The monarchy links us with our historical past, and I will prophesy uh, that it'll still be there at the end of the next century. Different, but as strong as ever.